Good morning, good afternoon doctors. Welcome to today's webinar. My name is Jazz Benga. I'm a senior consultant with a firm called Cirrus Consulting Group. We have a wonderful topic ahead of us, how to minimize lease costs and convert cash flow into retirement savings. I'm joined by a esteemed colleague with Four Quadrants Advisory, um, Casey Harris with the Four Quadrants team. He is the Director of Business Development and has some wonderful resources to talk about practice financials and how to plan for retirement. So I'll get the program started today and we'll discuss the first half of the program, which is specifically on dental office lease negotiations, the ins and outs of commercial real estate. So I always like to start off the program with a little bit about Cirrus. Um, I think it's important for you attendees to really understand how we specifically specialize in advising and representing dentists on commercial real estate matters. So interestingly, we were actually founded by a group of dentists back in 1994, given the significant gap between the business of dentistry as well as commercial real estate. As many of you have come quickly learned, it is very expensive on a per square footage basis to build a dental practice. So a group of brokers and real estate professionals came together with dentists given the unique nature of dentistry. You know, dentists typically stay in their location for their entire career and it's much more important to have a properly structured lease to protect their interests. So since our inception, we've negotiated over 10,000 dental office lease agreements all across North America, the US as well as Canada. We represent over a thousand doctors annually on matters related to leasing, purchase acquisitions, um, acquiring a practice, and all the components related to the real estate. So what makes our firm unique is we're not brokers by any stretch of the means. We're not working in a commission fashion. As many of you will quickly learn, brokers, as wonderful as they are at finding a location, they are commissioned by the landlord. So in theory, there is a conflict of interest given that they are negotiating against the party that is paying them. So our firm has a unique value proposition in the sense that we have everything in-house and do not derive commissions for our involvement. We have an in-house legal counsel, all with a background healthcare, uh, tenant representation, and very specific fo focus on negotiating with landlords. Or they are supported by our leasing division, all comprised of ex-brokers, providing our team, our negotiation team, with key performance indicators, average rental rates, vacancies, property details, and they are entirely supported by our consulting division. So I myself am a senior consultant with the firm. I lecture all across the country and provide these wonderful programs to really bring a sense of understanding as to the importance, the relevance of the lease agreement, how it can make or break the practice, and how to properly structure the agreement to protect your long-term interests, to avoid common traps and pitfalls from landlords. So in addition, we run about 150 CE programs all across the country, our keynote speakers at some of the large conventions, the Greater New York, Pacific Dental, Yankee Dental, and really, again, the focus is, let's start to provide value to the dental community, the healthcare community, as it relates to commercial real estate, to protect their long-term interests, to ensure that they're getting properly structured deals, affordable financials, and that their long-term interests are protected. So if you happen to attend any of the conference and you do see a member from my team, do pop by and say hi. And again, we work with dentists on a national basis. So what's the purpose of today's webinar? Uh, on my half of the pr program covering commercial real estate and the business of dentistry, we're gonna discuss the importance of the office lease agreement, why it is relevant to you much more so than any other commercial tenant. We will then move into a, some of the key terms and conditions within your office lease agreement. Uh, for the interest of time, I'll be covering off one specific term and condition, the option to renew, which will give you a sense of what we often find in commercial leases that negatively impact dentists. And lastly, I'd like to provide some practical advice, how to negotiate a lease agreement, when to start that program, and how best to have that conversation with your landlord. So I pose this question at all of my live seminars and I get a wide variety of answers. What is a lease agreement? So I ask you all, what is a lease agreement? What is the first thing that comes to your mind? The answer that I often get is a lease agreement is a contract between landlord and tenant. It is in fact. However, it is also a check. 
It is arguably one of the largest checks that you will ever sign in your entire life. Think about it. If we have a 2,000 square foot site where we're paying $5,000 a month, over an annualized basis, we're looking at $60,000 a year without any increases in rent. So let's say we were lucky and we negotiated flat rent for the next 10 years. That is a $600,000 commitment to the landlord. Now the average dental practitioner's career in solo practice is typically 30 to 40 years. So in 30 years, you are committing $1.8 million to the landlord in rent. So as I mentioned, the lease agreement is arguably one of the largest expenses that you'll ever incur in your entire career. So much more fundamental to ensure that the lease reflects your interest, protects your interest, as you are not an average tenant. You're not a law firm, you're not an accounting firm, you're not a nail salon or a bookstore that can pick up and move over the course of a weekend. Dentistry is unique. Once you're built into the practice and then into the space, you're typically there for your entire duration. So critical, again, to highlight the point that your lease is properly structured. So why is a document so important? So the lease document is so important because it does provide you long-term stability and security in the sense that for a dental lease agreement, we are typically signing as a new tenant, a 10 year lease with two five year options. And that gives you predictability in the space, given the significant investment to building out a dental practice. Today, we are seeing about $150 on average across the country in terms of build out costs, plumbing, electrical, conduits, things of those nature, in addition to equipment costs. So very important that we do get long term stability and security. We also want to minimize our risk and exposures. Most doctors that I speak with sign their lease agreement personally through their name as an individual. And critical as we move forward in our career that we provide a veil of protection from our personal assets. So critical that we structure the lease under some form of a corporate entity, separating personal from professional assets. We also want to minimize our exposures following the sale, which I will touch base on when we get to one of our um, examples or some of the verbiage that we often find. We'd also like to maximize our flexibilities, having items like a death and disability provision, the ability to transfer the lease agreement is critical in nature. What we agree to today will have an impact on your ability to sell 10, 20, 30, 40 years from when you sign that document. I, a key piece of advice that I give doctors all across the country is, a, start the process as early as possible when it comes to renewal or new deals. But also do not rush through the process. It is a fundamentally important document to the success of your business. It is the only document that binds you to the physical space. So critical that it is properly structured in all facets and aspects of the deal. We also want to ensure fair and affordable financial terms. Ensure that the lease is based on and the rental rates are based on fair market value. Ensure that any tenant improvement allowances that are provided at the beginning of the deal do not put our rent rates so far above what the market is asking, which would cause you problems as you continue to be a tenant in the property, because typically rents go up year over year. So important to understand what exactly the market is indicating in rent and ensure that we have a properly structured deal. And if all four aspects work well and are properly done, then it certainly does enhance your ability to sell your practice as well as maximizing from the sale of your practice. I always tell doctors, let's think long. Let's look at the end of the tunnel. Even if we're starting our private practice career today, important to understand our end game and our end goals. And ultimately that the sale is contingent on the transferability and quality of the lease agreement. So today's program, we will be covering off how to improve the quality of the lease agreement. So, when we're looking at the three saleable components of your practice, there's three major saleable components. We, the number one item is the goodwill. And again, these aren't typically to scale in any stretch of the means. And this is more specific to general dentistry. There's a, a separate matrix when we're looking at uh, specialties or you know other fields of dentistry. But for general dentists, goodwill makes a significant portion of the valuation. Then the appraisers will look at the depreciated value of equipment. What was equipment purchased for? What is our current value today? And lastly, 
and a buyer will evaluate the lease agreement itself. What are the terms and conditions? Are there terms that are onerous, such as a relocation clause, a redevelopment clause, early termination rights from a landlord, or are there item, items in the lease that are to their benefit, as well as the financial merits of the deal? The value of the sale is 100% predicated on the transfer of lease. So I ask you, if we cannot transfer the lease, can we really sell the business? And the answer is no. Without a transferable lease agreement, we're putting ourselves in a position where we can lose out on the subsequent sale when we're ready to retire. So again, to reiterate the point, even if we sign the lease agreement today, start evaluating the exit and the end goals and the transferability of the document. Because what we agree to in the lease agreement today will have an impact at the end of our career. So what's in your lease agreement? The first practical example that I like to go through is found on the option to renew. And this specific item is found in 90% of office lease agreements. So the option to renew occurs when we originally signed a lease agreement. From our recommendations, we typically sign a 10-year original term. And subsequently, we add two five-year options. So a 10 plus two five. So now we're in year eight or nine, and we're in a position where we need to evaluate the renewal. So we take a look at the option to renew language. What conditions do we need to abide by to renew the lease documents for the next five, 10, 15 years? So the example goes, provided that Dr. Joe Black shall remain as a tenant, and if the tenant duly and has regularly paid its rent and has performed its covenants and obligations under this lease and has not been in default, it shall have the option to renew this lease for a further term of five years, exercise about written notice. So I'll, I'll let that carry on for those of you that are following along, but in the interest of time, there are a number of implications based on how the option to renew is found. And much of it is found in legalese and verbiage. And that's how landlords trap you. The lease agreement is designed typically to represent the interest of the landlords. But given the unique nature and makeup of a dental specific tenant, we need to design the lease agreement to protect your interest as well as give the landlord some benefit. So the first issue that is identifiable in the option to renew is that provided that Dr. Joe Black shall remain as a tenant. So if we look at the word tenant, it is a capitalized term in the middle of a sentence, which means the word tenant is defined either on page one or two of the lease agreement. In this instance, the tenant referred to is Dr. Joe Black. What the language here and how it is structured, it's stating that this option to renew is exclusive to Dr. Joe Black. So what that means is that option is non-transferable. So typically when we're dealing with a practice acquisition, any prospective buyer would have to get approval from a lender, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, TD, uh, and some of the top tier lenders. And what the banks are saying today is that in order to finance the acquisition, there must be a minimum of five years of term or 10 years of term depending on the value of the acquisition. And what this agreement in this example is showing is that if Dr. Black was in year nine with two five-year options, he cannot transfer the lease agreement because that five -year, two five-year options are non-existent for any prospective buyer. It's exclusive to Dr. Joe Black. So critical that we have transferability of options in the interest of assigning the lease agreement. The second item here is, and if the tenant duly and has regularly paid its rent and has performed his covenants obligation under this lease and has not been in default, default being a defined term in the lease. We've seen examples where the doctor was not open Monday to Friday, which was inconsistent with what they agreed to on the lease. And the landlord openly took a picture of the front door where it showed that the doctor was closed every Friday and put the tenant in default, which means they were no longer allowed to express their option. And that's just one of many examples as it relates to default. You know, improper storage, poor removal of garbage, of trash, paying rent late to a certain degree. These are all items that put tenants in default, but are an easy way for a landlord to put the tenant in a less advantage situation in order to maximize the value from the negotiations on the landlord side. So critical that you evaluate and have full disclosure as to what is default and what constitutes default and negotiate certain items to prevent from going into default. Align the nature of your business 
with the lease agreement. Second, uh, thirdly, any such renewal shall be on the landlord's then current standard form lease. So wonderful, you have a two five year option, you're ready to express it, and the landlord says, great, in regards to the renewal, you are now obligated to sign this new doc document as per the original lease. And all items that were wonderfully negotiated in the first round of negotiations on the original deal are now null and void. And now, quote unquote, the landlord standard form lease can be completely amended to incorporate any items. And this is where we see landlords that are in a high density cosmopolitan area add in items like redevelopment or relocation clauses, which gives the ability for them to have flexibility with the property. Or if a, if a developer comes around, exercise a notice that there's a redevelopment that will occur, and guess what? The tenant is now out of the space. So typically what we want to have is that lease agreement shall be on the same current standard form lease or to be negotiated, and rental rates are also to be negotiated. Now it states in here that in no event shall the rent be paid in the last year of the original term. Now what the challenge with that is, very often on the original lease agreement, we'll find that many doctors have signed an agreement with a tenant improvement allowance incorporated into the deal, which means the rent rates are fluctuated as a result of taking an upfront loan. However, in most cases, that upfront loan in the form of an allowance, a construction allowance provided by the landlord, 20, 30, $40 a square foot to assist you with the build out of the practice is now built into the rental rates. However, landlords design lease agreements. So in year seven or eight, they break even on that initial loan. So the common concern here is that if, for example, we get to a renewal, the landlord can continuously escalate rental rates with the TI allowance built into the deal. Rents should be renegotiated based on fair market value, based on what's going on in the economy today, what other landlords are charging tenants across within a three, four, five mile radius. And that gives you the appropriate renewal costs. In other instances, we've seen fluctuations in the economy. Look back at 2008 when we had a significant mortgage crisis. Ultimately, if you signed your lease agreement at the height of the real estate market, 2007, and 10 years later you came to renewal, the market had adjusted. And the market had crashed in 2008 and rents had slowly escalated back to well below what it was in 2007, 2006 at the height of the real estate market. So with this type of language, if you signed at the height of a market, you will continue to pay escalations based on the last year. So again, rents are to be renegotiated. And lastly, we'll see language where it states, if the landlord and tenant are unable to agree on market rent within 60 days of the exercise by the tenant of its option to renew, the rent, the rent shall be then determined by arbitration based on the market rent for renewing tenants in the building. The challenge with this language is we do not see what other renewing tenants are paid or what the nature of their deal is. What if the landlord colluded with another tenant, gave them a significant allowance, which has now positively increases the overall rent for all other tenants? Unreasonable. We need to have fair market arbitration language based on your locality so that there's an arbitration process that is followed on renewals to ensure that you have favorable financials. So as you can see, there's a number of implications within the option to renew, and that's just the tip of the iceberg that we often find. Uh, again, in the interest of time, there are a number of other items that we discuss, such as assignment language, demolition language, relocation, death and disability, insurance, surrender, personal guarantees, termination rights. When we're evaluating a lease agreement, there are a, a number of components involved in that process. And in order to get the ideal outcome, it's fundamental to have a party that truly understands dental specific language that is working in your interest that is not getting paid by the landlord in the form of a commission because ultimately there's a conflict of interest there so the lease cycle so some practical advice on how to get the most out of your lease negotiation 
it is critical that you begin the process as early as possible. For those of you in attendance that are looking to start a brand new dental practice, typically that process takes 12 months to two years, 24 months. And the reason for that is you do not want to rush into a deal. You want to evaluate the marketplace, evaluate all availabilities, do a demographic analysis, and have a thorough understanding of what the real estate market is, is indicating. But in most examples, we're typically working with doctors that are renewing their lease. They're in year seven or eight of their lease agreement. And from a leverage standpoint, the ideal time to start the process is 24 months prior to expiration. As we move closer and closer to the expiration date, the leverage pendulum shifts towards the landlord because landlords are savvy and they understand that as a dental tenant, it takes an extensive amount of time to locate a space, to get permits, to build out a dental practice. On average, for a new start build out, we're looking at six months to a year from the moment they've signed the lease agreement to when they're open to see patients and get their certification of occupancy. And landlords take advantage of that situation. And when I worked on the opposite end of the spectrum on the property management side, my job was to delay the process as much as possible when it came to renewing tenants so that they got boxed in into the red zone and essentially we could provide them a take it or leave it deal. So to maximize the negotiations on a renewal, start the process early. And I always emphasize this, track critical dates, understand when the lease truly expires and when your option to renew deadline is. Because in most agreements, there's a, either a three, six, nine or 12 month window prior to the expiration where you need to notify the landlord. Be cognizant of those dates, track those dates. Track it on your phone, put it in a calendar invite, have an automated email that comes to you, but ensure that you're not missing critical dates because that's what landlords want. And that's how landlords win negotiations, by delaying the process and putting it onto the, the tenant to come to them to negotiate. Begin the process early and often. The right treatment plan. So here at Sirius, since we've been in business for the last 25 years, we do have a specific treatment plan that we are adamant all of our clients follow. And it starts with gathering all documentation. Now, that would include the original signed lease agreement, and it needs to be countersigned, a document that is signed by the tenant as well as the landlord. For those of you that do not have copies, I certainly encourage you to reach out to your landlord and advise them to send you a copy immediately have multiple records, practical advice, have a copy in the cloud, have one on your Gmail, have one on a USB zip drive. Last year, or the year before rather, with Hurricane Harvey, we had a number of clients in Houston, Texas, where the lease agreement was under six feet of water. And when it came to insurance payouts, reconstruction processes, they had to go to the landlord and request a copy because the landlord was aware that they did not have a copy. So critical that you gather all documentations, all original leases, any extensions, modifications, amendments. Once we secure a copy of the agreement, we will then identify your practice and career goals, where you are in your career, what the long-term outlook looks like. Are you looking to expand? Is there too much space? Um, are we looking to bring on associates? Are we looking to grow the business further? Some of the challenges facing your career. Are, we, is, are you a renewing tenant, a startup doctor, or a transitioning doctor? And that will all factor into how we specifically advise each and every one of our clients. Once we've identified our career goals, we then move on to reviewing the office lease for risk and traps, spending three to four hours going through each of the items line by line and understanding the exact terms and commitments in which the tenant is obligated towards. Then we move on by preparing with market research, getting a market analysis, understanding what fair market value is in rent, where rents are hovering, what vacancy rates look like, and having a true understanding of the economics of the area. Then we would sit with the doctor and have an outcome and strategy development plan. Prioritize, must have, would be wonderful to have, and items that we can concede on. It's important to, be, to give full disclosure when we're identifying practice and career goals, because depending on how the lease is structured, the outcome and strategy development can change for each doctor. But very often, there are similarities. Ensure that rents are favorable. Ensure that the lease can be transferred. 
ensure that we have flexibility vis-a-vis -a, -vis a death and disability provision. God forbid something happens to you that your family and estate are not obligated to pay rent. And importantly, also ensure that we're removing any personal guarantees, that you are no longer responsible on a personal level to fulfill the duties of the lease, nor is your estate. So now once we've gone through step one through five and we have a clean understanding and a very crystal clear perspective of exactly what the goals are, we then begin with the economics. Understand what we should be asking in rent, is there any allowances, free rent, fixturing period, and some concessions on rent. Now that there's cash on the dash, the landlord has formally agreed to rent, we then move to the legal terms all the terms conditions and amendments to properly protect your interest once we've come to agreement on that the final review and execution is critical to ensure that there's consistency on item eight in the process with items one through seven that we are capturing all the items discussed and negotiated with the landlord and they are all consistent in the lease agreement and that the landlord did not provide a bait and switch so whether you're working with our group or working with another party, important that we have a process in place before we pick up the phone and call the landlord. Really understand what we're looking to achieve, understand the terms and conditions, what the financials look like, and then speak with the landlord. Process is critical to a successful negotiation. So part of joining today's program, and I, I do have to wrap shortly so we can move on to Casey with four quadrants, is that for joining us today, we are providing a complimentary risk analysis. Typically, it's $1,400, $1,500 rather, for my firm to review the lease agreement cover to cover. We spend three to four hours analyzing all the risk traps within the lease, doing a financial audit of the lease agreement, an analysis of the document, and really aligning that with your career. For joining today's webinar, our, one of our corporate sponsors is covering the entire cost. It is on a first come and first serve basis. So for those of you that are interested in reviewing your lease agreement or setting up a consultation, please do email me. My name is Jazz Banga. Again, I'm a senior consultant with Cirrus Consulting Group. My email is jbanga at cirrusconsultinggroup.com. My number can be found at 866-739-9075, extension 3247. Um, there are a number of doctors that are on today's program, so it is on a first come, first serve basis. And essentially, just reach out to me. We'll set up the lease consultation in the next few weeks. We'll go through your lease agreement, provide you some wonderful guidance on how to properly structure the lease, what items are involved, and how we can maximize our tenancy through a properly, properly structured negotiation with the landlord. So thank you all for joining the first half of the program. I'm going to move on to Casey with Four Quadrants. Casey, take it away. Thank you, Jazz. Definitely some critical information around leases, and, and it is uh, vitally important. Um, my name is Casey, and I'm with Four Quadrants Advisory. Simply put, Four Quadrants Advisory helps dentists and specialists around the country maximize the profitability of their practices. Most dentists that I talk to tell me that at certain times within their career, they feel like that they're on a hamster wheel and on an island with no one to talk to about the business and finance side of their practice. Now, some of you on the phone today may relate to being a great dentist, being busy, being liked by most of your patients, and certainly seeing big numbers coming through your practice reporting, but not necessarily feeling like you're capturing enough income or retirement savings. Can anyone on the call today relate to all of your hard work not exactly being reflected by your income? I get the opportunity to speak to hundreds and hundreds of dentists around the country about these very topics, and today's framework about what we're going to talk about is going to be around maximizing the profitability of the practice and the challenges that actually get in the way of that. So first off, why dentistry? Many dentists get into dentistry uh, for reasons that they tell me, such as that they like to help people, they like the creativity of working with their hands. Maybe they had an old, older family member they looked up to that was a dentist. One of my favorites is that they thought they wanted to be a surgeon of some sort, but after job shadowing a surgeon compared to that of a dentist, the choice was real clear to them what, what path they wanted to go down. One reason I rarely hear as the primary reason for wanting to be a dentist is that it's because they wanted to run the day-to-day -day operations of, of a business. 
And conversely, most of the challenges a practice owning dentist faces are going to be from the business and finance side of the practice, not, not the clinical. So while dentists are serial overachievers who are used to people coming to you guys to help solve the problems, you all actually encounter most of your stress from that business side. And it makes sense if you consider these three things. Number one, the business side, not exactly the primary passion for why you wanted to be a dentist. Now, some of the secondary benefits of flexible schedule and things of that nature are definitely in play. But the business day-to-day -day is not the primary passion, typically. The second reason, you receive little to no business training in dental school to run a, a million-dollar business or a million-dollar practice. And really, the third one, you wear the hats of five C-level executives at minimum. Even if you have a great office manager, you're still the CEO, the chief operations officer, the chief financial officer, chief marketing officer, technology officer. And that's on top of what? Providing great dentistry. So it's no surprise a recent Gallup poll uh, showed that the average American retires at 62, yet the average dentist retires at 69. And the next slide really shouldn't surprise anyone either. This is dental retirement by the numbers, the most recent survey by the ADA. So these are your peers. And the first one shows us that $26,000 is on average what a dentist saves for retirement. And if you think that that's not enough, 96% of dentists polled agreed that they were under saving to maintain any sense of lifestyle um, in, in retirement. However, in dentistry, there's always that pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, right? Selling your practice. You're not going to like the next statistic, and I could probably speak for an hour just on this, but 80% of associates do not become partners. So it's a false belief to think that selling your practice is going to make up the majority uh, of, of your retirement. We have some internal data I also want to share, um, and I'll go through these quickly. But 82% of dentists say they don't really have a plan that connects their personal to their practice goals. 94%. Uh, of our survey says that they're not saving enough, so it's about a 2% margin of error from the ADA statistic. 85% of dentists feel that they don't really have anyone dental-specific to talk with who understands their practice, their specific practice. 88% say their existing team, and this isn't your staff that you employ, but your existing team, whether that be accountant, financial planner, business advisor, investment person, but that they can't really help you with major practice decisions. And it really comes down to consistent and predictable cash flow. And we see it all the time. Dentists are just told if you want to make more, just produce more. And so the dentist who may have that seven or $800,000 practice, they feel if they can just produce more, they're going to make more. Guess what? I see it all the time, that, that $1.4, $1.5 million practice where the dentist, is bit, the dentist is busier, and they're seeing bigger numbers come through on the reporting, but they're still wondering where all the money's going. They, they don't actually feel like they're capturing it in terms of income, retirement savings, some of those really crucial points. And so we're going to get into some cash flow killers, as I'm going to call them. But these are just eight. These are just the top eight. There's dozens of these, but these are areas that dentists potentially can struggle with, and if they don't get their arms around it, um, it's going to keep them on that hamster wheel of not being able to earn more and save more. So the first one, and keep in mind, as I go through these, ask yourself, do a little self-analysis, how are you doing on each one of these? No one of these can take you down, but if you start adding them up, it's going to be really hard uh, to have the success that you want to have. But the first one is high insurance adjustments. Very popular topic tough topic for many people. Uh, I'll say this. For us, if we see clients that are uh, over 15% in insurance adjustments annually, for us, that's a red flag or an indicator that there may be something that we need to look at uh, or, or analyze. Now, I said no one of these can take you down, but if your insurance adjustments are 25 30% and you have reactive tax planning, meaning not really sure what your tax situation is going to be, it's sort of a uh, Surprise when you meet with your accountant and many times you owe thirty or forty thousand dollars a year. If you're having a forty thousand dollar tax surprise and have twenty five percent insurance adjustments, 
that hamster wheel that I alluded to, it's going to be really hard to get off of it. These two right here are really important. How about staff and hygiene inefficiencies? Is your hygiene department producing three times what you pay them? That's a metric and a data point that's important and, and that needs to be uh, made aware. Practice account balances can be a real source of stress. And so when you think about a 12-month uh, time frame about your practice account balance, if it's low or fluctuating, has twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 swings constantly, that's a sign that their systems and processes not in place, and that can really be a hindrance and a, and a stressful uh, area in your situation. It doesn't have to be that way. The next one, actually the next two, when I say paycheck to paycheck living and inefficient income structuring, hear me, it doesn't mean your, your water is going to be turned off or your lights are going out. Y'all are dentists, probably doing better than your friends and your neighbors. But what I mean by this, if you're someone who pays yourself and you say, yeah, I just take what's left over at the end of the month, or sure, sometimes I might have to skip skip paying myself for a month, but I'll make it up in a, in a distribution down the road. Those are not good systems and processes to be in place, and actually that cornerstone of income structure for the dentist is important. So if you're someone who's just taking what's left over or skipping paychecks, again, it's a sign, it's a red flag that there's massive improvement that can be made that can help you maximize profitability and be all that you can be. The next one we'll talk about is lack of retirement strategies. If there's ever a group that has great excuses while, why to delay saving for retirement, it's dentists. You have student debt. A lot of you buy a practice. You have a staff that you employ and payroll. There are a lot of reasons to kick that can down the road. But I can't emphasize this enough. There's a delicate balance between paying down debt and saving for retirement. And it's important that there is a retirement strategy in place early. And obviously, the time value of money is a, is a real important principle of this. But if you don't have a retirement strategy, if that's not a focus, it should be. And, and that can be a, a real hindrance with helping you maximize the profitability of your practice. The eighth one I'll talk about is lack of comprehensive approach. It's the most general one, but probably the most important. Almost everyone that we work with, they came to us and they already had a team in place, an accountant, a financial planner, a business advisor, an investment person, and they were working individually in silos all around town, not really communicating together, sort of piecemealing different things in. They were all doing an okay job, but that lack of comprehensive approach, especially in dentistry, especially with all the nuance that, that is on the business side of your practice, having a comprehensive approach and a comprehensive team that's communicating with each other massive synergies with that. And, and again, just with these eight uh, cash flow killers, if you start to add those up and ask yourself, um, how am I doing on those, and you don't feel great, um, you're still probably going to do okay. But ask yourself, is okay good enough? Do you want to settle? Or are these things that you want to start getting your arms around and mastering? Because as we start to add up these dozens and dozens of cash flow killers for our clients, we're talking hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. So really with this, it, it comes down to if you answered yes to, to a lot of these um, that, you're not, that you struggle with, it's going to make it very difficult to get off the hamster wheel, be a multimillionaire in dentistry, and, and retire on your terms. Now, you've heard me talk here for about 10 minutes, and I think it's important that you hear from your peers. And so I'm going to attempt to show a quick video. I, w I would say that our call um, to four quadrants was probably like, well, you either, we either call four quadrants or we get divorced. We were having a lot of surprises from our accountant. And we wanted things a little more steady, automated. And we really didn't have a plan for retirement other than we were maxing out you know, our, our plan that we had in the office. but. It, it was insufficient. Doing the dentistry is the easy part and uh, running the business is the difficult part. Before we came out of Port Clarence, 
I would kind of wonder, is there going to be a bonus? And when will the bonus be paid? And I feel a little uneasy about that because I didn't really know. And then I'd go home and then I, I would get the same thing from Sherry. And I felt so bad. I felt like I'm dumb, number one. <laughs> number two, it's like I should... I should be smart enough to find the answer, but, but I don't really want it. I don't really want to ask for the answer. I just want it to happen. You know, and then she'd get upset and be like, well, you should know this. Don't you own the practice? You should know this. And I'm like, yeah, you're right, honey, you're right. It's like, I know I should, I don't. I, I'll, I'll try to find out what I can. I just felt like we never knew. And not knowing, having an answer to all that was really, really hard for me. I, I think that was really, really difficult on a marriage, and it's got to be difficult in a practice. When we left here last year, he said, well, you know, you, you could probably expect to put away this much this year for, for retirement, and I'm thinking, wow, that would be awesome if I could do that. And then they showed me the figure today, and it exceeded that amount by over 50%, and I'm like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? I, I couldn't believe it. It's just like, this is phenomenal. This is probably going to be the best thing that we have ever done or could do for our families and for our practice. We didn't feel any pinch at all at home. It was like it was effortless. We know now if there's something that we want to look at, buying or a move to make, it's not just between the two of us. We've got some people that we trust, that are experts, that will be able to tell us this should be a go or this should be a no-go, and why. It makes it a lot easier for us to look at each other and say, yeah, we're going to do this, and it's going to work. I'd recommend Four Quadrants because we end up making more money and saving a lot more money than we would have doing it our old way with our old accountant or with what we thought were the right ways to do it. So we, we didn't have to change anything as far as what was going on in the practice because there was some fear early on that might be an issue. We're gonna have to practice differently. It has nothing to do with practicing differently. It's just what's all going on financially with the practice. So, and that was, that was really easy. It really didn't take much work from me or from Barry in, in doing any of that. It's nice to know that um, comfortably putting away money for retirement. Uh, if I've got any real difficult business questions, I have a you know, group of people that I can contact any time and they can answer my questions for me. It makes it easier for us to not not have the stress or the worry. We can just kind of forget about that, know that it's handled and it's handled very well. We can just be Dennis. Nice to have a team behind us. It's been better than expected, better than anticipated. So it's been a great partnership for, for Barry and I. Now, with something of this nature, there's an obstacle to this. There's always an obstacle to becoming better, right? If I want to be stronger, the obstacle is getting into the weight room and lifting. Any skill set, there's an obstacle. Same thing with this. For a dentist to maximize the profitability of their practice, have the self-awareness to know they're clinically great, but from a business and finance side, they can be good, but they're still on a grand scale of a practice owner, too much slipping through the cracks. So what are those obstacles? It's all around mindset, constructive criticism, coachability, right? Dentists are used to people coming to them to solve, to solve problems. Does someone have the awareness to say, you know what, if there's a better way, I'm open to it. And if someone can show me data and metrics to help me capture more income and retirement and have a good strategic direction around my practice, I'm very coachable to that. How about the ability to want to change? I'll be honest, I don't like change. Change is uncomfortable. But with change, a lot of times comes some really positive things. Here's a quote that I want to share. Start treating the business side of your practice with the same expertise 
as you treat the clinical. I know this because so, so many dentists, y'all are so proud of the clinical skill sets that you've learned, not only in dental school or, or as a specialist, but with all the continuing education, with all the, 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 uh, the, the trainings that are out there to, to really hone your craft clinically. There's an amazing amount of pride that comes around that. But for some reason with the business side, uh, too many dentists just kind of ignore it and kick the can down the road. And for me, I would just challenge anyone on here that has that feeling in the pit of their stomach that there maybe could be some improvements on the business and finance side. Don't settle. Start treating that business side of the practice with that same expertise that, that you treat the clinical. And I think that it is, is extremely, extremely important uh, to understand. So I want to share with you some statistics. And what this is around are, for me, it's called the proof in the pudding, right? These are average. These are average results, 36 months of, of people who got their financial house in order, um, of people who decided they are going to um, uh, not settle, and, and, and we're going to really, really do the, the right thing. And this is simply on average within 36 months. Overhead decreases 11%. Income increases 25%. Here's the big number. Retirement savings increases 670%. I'm going to give you an example of what that looks like because that's a real big number. Talking to someone out in California, and they were saving about $18,000 a year from retirement and, and really did try to put a focus on it. And I kept talking about how you should be saving more, you should be saving $100,000 for retirement given the size of your practice. And, and that person was very frustrated at me for, um, for, for not uh, uh, thinking that they could save $100,000 and, and, and what have you. Long story short, they went from saving $18,000 a year to in year two, uh, working with us to saving $153,000 for retirement. And I would remind them when they, when they come in, you were mad at me for saying that it was possible. Um, and, and the quote from them was, I didn't even feel it. it. It was there the whole time within my practice. I just wasn't capturing it. So when I talk about 670% increased retirement savings, that's what I mean, taking someone that may be saving $18,000 a year and taking them to saving over $100,000 a year, those percentages uh, really go up. One of my favorite numbers is 1.7% of increased production. At the beginning of this, I said how so many dentists are told if you want to make more, just produce more. For us, it's not about more, it's about better because our average is 1.7% of increased production. And as you look at these statistics, ask yourself, what would these mean for you? and for your practice, and for your income, and for your retirement, and, and for your life. And these are just four initial basic statistics that we have. Um, and, and, and we have folks who have done incredibly better than this. These are just averages. But I, I think it's important to share those with you. Now, there's a couple things that I want to share. Um, number one, there's going to be a poll at the end of this today. And I would encourage all of you uh, to take a look at that poll. Uh, but similarly uh, with Jazz, and we're going to wrap up a little early, um, but similarly, similarly to what Jazz said, um, for me it's all about someone identifying that, you know what, it may be worth a 15-minute phone call to see what those statistics would mean to me and to see if there's areas that I could help maximize the profitability of my practice. Send me an email. My direct number's on here. For me, it's about scheduling 15-minute conversations with, with dentists around the country to see who does have that achiever mentality and, and who does want to maximize and not settle and be all that they can be. And, and, and so get a hold of me, get a hold of Jazz if you have anything regarding um, lease and that, because that can also be a real cash flow killer, and that can stick to you for a long time. Um, but take the poll at the end. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Jazz here um, to sort of close us up, but I wanted to... Uh, thank everybody for my portion of it. Jazz, are are you there?
Jazz, are you, are you with us here? I've got the, the last slide up. And really, this is your opportunity to schedule your complimentary um, lease consultation, number one, that's really important. And his information's on here. And again, um, if, if you want to talk about business and- Hey, Casey, I'm back online. Just uh, again, Sorry, for those I of you that are early. interested in either of the reviews with Casey or myself, um, feel free to email either of us to set up the consultation. Um, we would be delighted to either review your lease or provide you some financial guidance.